Today our reading comes from Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. We'll read Genesis 2, verse 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us your word. Father, we pray that this morning your word would transform our lives. Father, we pray that we would be surrendered to your word and that we would wrestle with the complexity of our own will, our own tradition, our own thoughts, our own ideas, and that we would find truth and revelation in you and you alone. Father, I pray that uh, these words that um, exegete pages out of your holy text would glorify you. We just magnify the name of our Father, and we ask all this in the name of Jesus, in all of God's favorite people said, amen. Well, I am glad you're here. If this is your first time here, uh, we're in the middle of a series, and by the middle, I mean the beginning, uh, of uh, the, the origin story. The Hebrew word is bereshith, and in the, in the, we translate that as Genesis. And Genesis simply means in the beginning. And we've been looking at the creation story and, and what the Father has done and, and how he was intimately involved. And, and today... We're just really going to look at three verses. Maddie read several over us, but we're just really going to focus on a few verses, and this is why it's going to offer us somewhat of a juxtaposition. Uh, we'll, we'll look at things that might contradict themselves, or for you, it might be the first time you've ever heard this, and so it's going to cause you to wrestle. Now, here's my hope. Hear my heart. You guys know I love people, man. My heart is that you would allow these truths to rest in you. And I and our pastoral team, we, we can't make some of these decisions for you, but I still believe that they're truth. This is what I want to focus on today. I want to focus on work, and I want to focus on rest. But in the middle of those is, is our witness. Now, when the, the Bible teaches that Jesus said, I want you to go and be my witnesses, it's actually from a Greek word where we would translate it martyr. So Jesus' challenge, which if I was his PR person, I'd be like, yo, hey, Zeus. Uh, I don't know if I'd call him that. Uh, I'd be like, uh, listen, I, I need you to, to, to figure out a little bit better of a marketing campaign. Whenever you show up on the scene and you're telling people to come and die, I'm just letting you know that isn't selling well. And then I would say, now you're telling people to take up their cross and follow you. Once again, this is a bad sales pitch. Let's just talk about all the good stuff. It's not how he came. Matter of fact, what, what disturbs me most about Jesus, if he would, could speak, and I believe he does through his scripture, if he could speak to this thing called the American church, the Western church specifically, I think he would say, I told a parable. And the parable was simple. The parable was this, count the cost before you come and follow me. Jesus says, I, I, I get to be Lord. I, I get to be king. And, and to be real honest, I wrestle with that. And so today, I promise you, you're going to wrestle with this text, and, and it's okay. Every week, I, I try to remember, I'll be up here to answer any questions, because I know some of the stuff, like we haven't even got to the Nephilim. I know some of y'all read ahead because you text me, and it's fine. Keep reading ahead. But 
I want you to know that man, my heart is for you. So I want you to hear this in love. Whatever I say today, however the Holy Spirit guides, and of course I have some thoughts written down on a piece of paper, but I, I want you to know that everything I say is in love today. If you're new around here, or you're a guest, I'm talking to people who are fully devoted followers of Christ, okay? I'm talking to people that say, I'm gonna die to myself and I'm gonna let Jesus be the king of my life because I believe he's resurrected. What that means is the reason that we gather collectively as a church is to celebrate the resurrection of this person named Yeshua, and, and he really lived, and the, uh, he was the Mashiach Nagid in the Hebrew, which means he was the Messiah King. He was the anointed one. He was foretold about. Matter of fact, we knew the exact dates based upon a, a mathematical equation given in the book of Daniel of the exact time of his arrival when he would triumphantly enter into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. All of that was, it was all planned out. We believe that he died, but he resurrected. So that's why we gather. We gather to celebrate the resurrection of our Messiah who took our sin upon a cross so that we could be seen righteous in God's eyes. That's what we do what we do. And so if you're still on that journey and you got more questions than you got answers, this is a safe place for you to ask big questions. We want you to ask them. We've all that are pursuing the Messiah, we've all wrestled with him just like you have. We, we've tried to come to a very intellectual decision on why we follow Jesus. And so today, I just want to remind you that God spoke, he made and he created, meaning when he spoke, something happened. When he created, uh, when he made, it means he got his hands intimately involved in creation. Still kind of baffles my mind. And then it says that he created, and it's a, a unique characteristic of God alone. It means he created something out of nothing. And then last week, we, we, we really looked at we have a responsibility to be image bearers, that he created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. And he created them male, and he created them female. And so, we sit here, and we wrestle with, okay, how do we bear the image of God? So there's two questions I want you to ponder today. You can write these down if you want to, but I want you to think about them this week. Uh, let me... There's this thing, and uh, it's called the curse of knowledge. And the curse of knowledge means I assume or you assume that the other person knows what you're talking about. So let me break the curse of knowledge. As a follower of Jesus, when you gather collectively, whether it's in a small group or whether it's in a setting like this, your responsibility is to hear, to listen, to receive from the Holy Spirit, and then sometime this week, rest in it. Say, God, how am I supposed to apply? God, what are you personally asking me to do? And I promise you, if you open up a journal, open up your notes on your phone, and say, speak to me. I promise you he'll do it. And so today is, is one of those instances where this week you're going to have to wrestle with the text. So here's the two questions. Question number one is, what are you giving your life for? You're giving your life for something. What are you giving your life for? The second question I want you to wrestle, ponder, pray through this week and today as you're listening is what are you trading your life? And by trading, <clears throat> I mean exchanging time for money. I, I want you to ask, God, what am I giving my life for and what am I trading my life for? So I'm just going to open up and I'm just going to create a lot of non-fans, which I didn't get into this to make fans. But I'm going to teach you a principle that will be life transforming if you prayerfully consider how to apply it. The principle is this. It's called the six-day principle. Now, if you've invited either Ashley or I into that sacred place of discipleship, I don't go looking uh, for people. I, I look for people to, to bring them into knowledge of Jesus. But my goal in life is to then disciple people that want to open up their lives. Ashley's the same way. And if you've hung around us at all, you know that we've lived our lives by this principle, okay? Now, I know I look like I'm probably in my late 20s, early 30s. Um, what was it? Are we laughing? Golly, I thought we were friends. Okay, late 40s. Okay, it's, uh, I'm 44 years old. And since I was a, a young adult, I decided to live my life by this principle. I want you to know that it isn't easy and it's countercultural. But the Bible clearly lays this idea out for us. Now, if you invite us into your life,
to be discipled, you're gonna, we'll talk to you about this principle. What we notice is, is a lot of people, they, they don't really want to be discipled. They want to be coddled, right? Uh, and so what we try to do is see the potential in people and then try to pull it out. But listen, if, if you're going to say, hey, I'm committed to doing this and we're committed to doing this and all you do is pay lip service, I lose interest. Because whatever I tell you I'm going to do, I'm going to do. And so we, we, we have this tension of the six-day principle. Now, what I know is it's counterculture, which everything in Scripture is. But what we really have to wrestle with today is slowness versus slothfulness. What we really have to wrestle with today is intentionality versus laziness. Now, if you're in Genesis, if you go to the next book, it's Exodus. Genesis and Exodus are are two of the first five books of the Bible. They're they're revered. They're they're, they're known as the Torah. But in the book of Exodus, and if you want to turn there to the 23rd chapter, in this text, uh, Moses is trying to describe to the nation of Israel, the people who are following after God, how they're supposed to live. And these are his words. Verse 12. Six days. Everybody say six days. See, I didn't make it up. It's in the book. Six days you shall work. But on the seventh day, you shall rest. What does rest mean? Thanks for asking. He goes to clarify that your ox and your donkey may have rest. I don't have an ox. I don't have a donkey. But I do have a computer. I I do have a cell phone. That thing keeps me like, hmm. You're like, are you asking me to shut off my cell phone one day a week? I double dog dare you. And then he says, and then the sons of your servant, women, and the alien may be refreshed. Alien means foreigner. It means people who were working among but weren't a part of this nation of Israel. I'm trying to think how to say this in a way uh, that will resonate. Time is the most valuable commodity the Father has entrusted you with. You'll be like, what about my chitlins? Oh, those two. What about my career? Yes, two. But time is the most valuable commodity that he has entrusted you with. What do I mean? Well, this is what I mean. I mean that there is, you have an income. You have an income of time. I, I laid it out for us. Here it goes. There's 1,440 minutes in every day. I didn't know that. I looked it up on the internet, okay? That means that there is 168 hours in a week. If either one of these numbers are wrong, blame Google, okay? That's what you've been entrusted with. So let me paint a picture of your, of your work week. Let's say you spend 40 hours a week working. <clears throat> now, some of you, if you're working over 50, 55 hours, there's something wrong with your employer or you might be missing your calling. We also spend 56 hours sleeping. I wish. Praise the Lord. If a brother could get eight hours of sleep a night, I'd be glory and I, I don't get it. I don't get it. But in a perfect world, and one, one day when all these kids are gone that Ashley loves. No, I love them too. I, I do all 10 of them. So that means you have 72 hours left a week. Uh, hold on. I know some of you are getting uncomfortable. It's okay. Don't be mad at me. Be mad at the word. What are you doing with these 72 hours that you are stewarding? What are you doing with these 72 hours of income? Now, I wrote some things down because I know what you're going to tell me. Well, one of the things I process as a communicator is I always try to overcome the objections that I know are coming my way. Well, what about family time? And I hope at minimum, let's say you're spending three hours a day with your family. You're being intentional and in discipling them. You're watching movies with them. You're teaching them the word. You're beating them and dominating them in board games as every good dad should do. Don't let them win. Don't teach them that. Dominate. I have not lost a battle of TikTok or t- what TikTok. I'm not even on TikTok. What's it called? Tic Tac Toe. Yeah, that's it. I, have not, I don't let them win. There's been a bunch of cats, but I ain't trying to lose. Checkers? No, 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 no. You ain't beating me in checkers. They get to chess and you'll dominate me because I don't even understand the game, but maybe you're spending three hours a day. So let's just say 21 hours a week with family. Let's say that you are intentional about your development, both physically and spiritually. And so you hit the gym or you study the word and and you practice these means of grace, 
Praise God. I hope that you do that for 10 hours a week. You got 20 hours with your family. What does that mean? I'm not good in math, but that means you have 41 hours left. I don't know if you've ever looked at your income of minutes, of moments, of hours. What I would suggest is if you're anything like me, I I waste a lot of time. See, I'm... I would strongly suggest it's not that you don't have enough time. It's that you're not stewarding your time well. Now, you know, I go to culture because I always wonder what culture says about these things. So uh, a couple of months ago, Business Insider wrote an article, and they wrote the article about how detrimental a six-day work week was. And they lined it out. And I was like, okay. Well, maybe those people aren't doing what they're called to do, and that's why they live exhausted lives. Because as far as you can go back, matter of fact, let me explain this to you. When this text was written, Rome had an eight-day work week. You're like, Ryan, it's only seven days. I I know. (laughs) Bad at math. He's like, he doesn't even do math well. They had an eight-day work week, and then on the ninth day, you got the day off to go shopping for food. To run your errands. I don't know what errands ran. Like they jump on your donkey and you go get your soul sticks. I have no idea. But they had a seven-day work week. And these people of God are honoring God with one day. As a matter of fact, all through history, whether it's Babylon or whether it's Egypt, that's one of the things they didn't like about these Jewish people, that they would take a day off of work every week and give it to God. But they worked six days a week. Now, some of you might know that historically... Up until about 100 years ago-ish, in the Industrial Revolution, it was really Henry Ford, and there's a couple other names. I just knew that one because you guys would probably know that one. There's several others that instituted this five-day work week, and they gave the weekend, and it was really to honor two religions, Judaism and Christianity, in their two Sabbaths that they were wrestling with. So what is the six-day work week look like? I think you're going to have to decide if you're willing to exchange your soul for souvenirs. I I don't know if you know this. I don't know if you've been to a funeral lately. Um, But nothing goes in the box. Usually it's a good looking suit, maybe, or dress. Sometimes there's a memento. I remember when my father passed away five years ago, I remember wrestling, like, is there something I want to put in there? I wrestled with it. But nothing goes in the box. Matter of fact, I read this story about a wealthy individual who just, he did not like his family. He's a multimillionaire. And in his will, he said that none of the money could go to any of his family. And he wanted to be buried with it. So his wife, understanding who he was and just a little bit smarter than he was, just wrote him a check and put it in the casket. (laughs) Cash it when you get there, bro. (laughs) Nothing goes with us. And I, I feel a lot of people are exchanging trinkets and souvenirs for their soul. Like, he's telling me I'm working six days a week. Just stay with me. Are you sacrificing quality of life so that those around you have a better perception of you? When we choose to exchange our soul, Dr. Tim Keller, if you guys hang around me, you know know, I'm quoting quite a bit. He's a retired pastor, planted a church in New York City. Um, He's influenced a lot of my thinking. Here's a quote that he says. If we take our meaning in life from our family, our work, a cause, or some achievement other than God, they enslave us. Leave that up there. what, What am I trading my life for? What am I exchanging my life for? And if I'm really honest, what's enslaving me? I know that's some deep stuff. You're like, man, I waded into the deep end this weekend. I want you to pray about it this week. 
Are you exchanging time for your family so that you can have two car payments? Are you exchanging time from your family so you, your, your house has a little bit more square footage that I promise you nobody cares about? What if you set a new normal? What if you just decided, <clears throat> you know what, I'm not going to be chasing trinkets and treasures in exchange for my soul or my family's soul? What if you decided, I'm going to prayerfully consider, Father, what you want me to do with my life? And maybe a step down is actually a step up. So I want you to know that I'm not suggesting that you even go to work for six days. Now listen, for those of you that own businesses in the house, maybe that's what you're supposed to do. I'm not going to argue with you. I would like to hear your justification. I'd like to see your schedule of time and see if there's a way that maybe you're wasting and not investing time the right way. But what would you do with an extra work day? What if you just believed that this six-day principle is true? What if you just said, you know what, I'm going to take one day off a week. I, I don't understand it. I'm just going to do it. And I want to see if I don't feel more refreshed, more replenished. What would you do with an extra work day? Maybe you could volunteer at a charity and every week make somebody's life better for free. Maybe you could give your time to an organization in our city or your city that's making an actual difference in people's time, in their lives, and you just show up and you just serve. What if you have this outlet, like maybe it's a creative outlet, maybe it's writing, maybe it's art, uh, <clears throat> maybe you like to go and haggle at garage sales and then resell stuff online. Whoever you are, you guys are amazing. You like resell stuff on eBay that you found at garage sales. It blows my mind. Well, maybe that side hustle starts to support missionaries all over the world. I'm not telling you to go and work for the man or the woe man an extra day, but what I am telling you is we cherish the weekend and it's made us sloppy. Because according to the Father, six days we will work and one day we will rest and that will be enough. Yes, it makes me extremely uncomfortable. Yes, it's been hard. Yes, it's not been every week of the last 20 some odd years of our marriage. But we intentionally always either have a side hustle or always have something we're willing to give our lives for. Write this down. It's not going to be on the screen. Could have added it this morning. A single moment of procrastination can destroy a month of hard work and discipline. A single moment of procrastination. What is procrastination? Procrastination is, I'm just going to go ahead and do that tomorrow even though I know I can get it done today. Now, if you're anything like me, I actually have the spiritual gift of procrastination. I don't know if you said, oh, okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, anymore? Anymore? Okay, yeah. Thank you, Father. It's in the book of Assumptions. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Assumptions is not a real book, real book for those of you that are like, still trying to wrestle with all of them. But a single moment of procrastination, and then what happens is it becomes this snowball effect that actually will ruin a, war, a, a month of hard work and discipline. See, for some of you in this house, those of you online, the Father is calling you into something deeper. He's asking you to be more committed to the ecclesia, more committed to the mission of the church. He's asking you to be, to, to be a servant in his community. Last week, uh, if, if you don't know Johnny and Mike, uh, I, uh, uh, man, you're missing out. Uh, one, because Johnny has the coolest last name of anybody in the church. It's Yahola. Um, when I see him, I always say, Johnny Gringo. That's what I say in my head. But Johnny Yahola comes out. That's a movie reference. It's probably 20-something years old. I need to update my material. It's not a big deal. I heard Johnny and Mike talking, they don't even know, I just walked up last week, and they're like, isn't it cool we get to do this again? Johnny goes, yeah, they let us do it again. See, we've created this culture around here that we don't have to, we get to, and people like them get it. We don't have to serve in kids, we don't have to serve as a greeter, we don't have to clean toilet, we get to. 
We don't have to open our house for small group. We get to. We don't have to inconvenience our lives by being involved in biblical community. We get to. We don't have to show up early and stay late. No, no, no. We get to. And it's this mentality that some of you are being called towards. It's a deeper calling that the Father is placing on you so that you can bring refreshment to his ecclesia. Ecclesia is the Greek word for church. It is the gathering of God's people. Years ago, uh, uh, before this was, uh, most of you know that I I have one small part-time hustle that I do. Ash and I have another side hustle that we do, and then the, the church pays most of my salary. But long before then, Ashley and I just decided we were going to be six-day people. And there was a season of our lives that we just decided the church was going to get all of us. And so we were setting up and tearing down this church I was at. And so every Sunday morning, the church got me at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I wasn't done until 1.30. Every Sunday, I was there at both services that they had, and I just served The best I could almost every week, whenever my my employer started asking me to work on Sundays, I remember being so torn about whether I was supposed to leave my job or what I was supposed to do. But the reason that I did that is I showed up, I served the house of God, I served the people of God. In the afternoon, I usually was hanging out with someone, a part of the ecclesia, and then at night, I poured my life into my family. And you know what? The burden of Monday was lifted because I saw it as the first day of the work week. Monday was. Now listen, that's not the call for all of you. Some of you, this is your day of rest, and I'm, I'm cool with that. Whenever you start talking about the Sabbath, people are like, is it this day or is it that day? If you want to know what I think, you can go back to our series, 10 Rules for Life, or uh, uh, Passover, no, yeah, Passover to Pentecost, it's, it, it's in the archives. I'm not here to argue a day. What I'm here is I'm, I'm here to defend the principle. I'm not sure what you're supposed to be doing with your sixth day. It's not for me to decide. But I know, biblically speaking, the Bible knows no such thing of the weekend. The Bible knows no such thing of retirement. Just like the Bible knows no such thing as dating. Listen, I got five daughters, so I'm all for arranged marriages. If you'd like to submit your applications, let me know about you. You know, child's potential earning income. You know what I mean? We have an application. I'm kidding. I don't. I'm gonna. I'm, someone remind me to put together an application. The Bible doesn't know anything about retirement. Should you be wise and be good stewards? Yes. And if you need help in that, there's people in our house that will help you. I want you to be a good steward. But the Bible doesn't want you to retire so then you can negate responsibility. Just like the Bible wants you to work six days and rest one. In Exodus chapter 23, it says, you shall rest. It's saying that you need to rest one day. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the Sabbath. In Genesis chapter 2, it was read over us, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and the host of them, everything was finished. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day. Friends, hear me. God did not need rest. God modeled it. God's like, man, I was exhausted. I've been making, speaking, and creating. (laughs) I need a nap. No, 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 no. He was modeling a principle for those created in his image. Do you know that Sabbath, that day, it's a gift? Yes, it's a command, but it's a gift. You're invited to rest. The scriptures teach us that, that the Sabbath, this idea, was made for man. <clears throat> it was a gift. It wasn't a burden. It's like God is saying, listen, following me, life isn't always going to be easy. You're going to need rest and replenishment for your soul. And if you'll just give me a day and you'll just rest, It's this affirmation of the sovereignty of God, knowing that the Father is ultimately the one who's in control. He doesn't slumber. The scripture says that he neither slumbers nor sleeps, but it's so that you can. It's so that you can have rest. See, Sabbath keeping is this physical manifestation, if you will, of salvation by grace. It's an act of resistance, if you will, 
at the desire to be defined by what we create and what we accomplish. Sabbath is the ultimate trust in God that he will be able to do more with less. See, the Sabbath is about rest, if you like to write things down, but it's also about work. See, the Sabbath says, one day my life is going to look differently. It's the Father's invitation to tell you that you are more important than your work, no matter how important your work is. It's one day. This is where it gets uncomfortable for me. The Sabbath forces me to uncover what really gives me my identity. Just one more call. One more email. <laughs> I, 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 I just, I, I, I'm not done. We live in this peculiar generation in, in uh, where we are right now. The older generation, if you will, they worshiped work. They, they, they worshiped the company logo. They, they commended loyalty. You went one place, you stayed forever. <clears throat> their, their position in their company wasn't defined as much by where it was, but by whose team they were on. And so there was this loyalty, this brand, this, this logo. They were proud of the small businesses competing with the big boys. Ultimately, they were defined by their job. Flip side. Uh, now, we have this younger generation that worships play and recreation. They worship the weekend. They define their lives by their experiences. They, 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 they want to give themselves to experiences instead of a ex life full of experiences. They don't waste their time with family. They're thinking, how inconvenient could that be? I can't pack up and do everything. They're just trying to figure life out. And the logo, the company, is only important if culture says it is. They desire shallow roots instead of being deeply planted. Now, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. Both of them are forms of idolatry. <laughs> but both of them have the ability to impact your rest, and I just want to invite you to rest. Look at our culture. It's overwhelmed. Our lives are out of balance. We empty our time and our energy and our resources, and we are so fatigued. I'm challenging you to discover or rediscover the benefit of slowness. See, Hebraically speaking, uh, Sabbathing wasn't about not doing anything. It, it was specifically about to not profit from your work. So I, I challenge the men that I pour into all the time. If you work with your hands, then, then Sabbath with your mind. If you work with your mind, then Sabbath with your hands. Spring is coming, and I just love to get my hands dirty in the dirt. <laughs> in the yard, and in the garden, and I have two black thumbs. There's no green. I kill things all the time. I love to be outside. I, I love to go <clears throat> golfing, and I am awful. Like, if one of y'all love me, you could just pay for some golf lessons. I don't know. Help a brother out. It's not the clubs. It's me. You know what I mean? Some people, oh, it's my clubs. No, no, it's you. <laughs> it's you. But I love to be outside. And so I, there's these moments that I'm very intentional about the way that I, I Sabbath. And sometimes Sabbath is work. It, it's, it's a different kind of work. It doesn't mean that you lay in your bed and you do nothing. <clears throat> it just means you honor the Father with rest. In Exodus, that where we read in 23, if you want to go back a couple chapters to Exodus chapter 20, this is what the text says. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Keep it sanctified. Keep it set apart. And then he reminds us of the creation story. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all the things in them. And then he rested on the seventh day. Remember, he didn't need to rest. He modeled rest. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
can we just admit that this thing we call the normal life is not normal? Can we just admit that maybe we, as followers of Messiah, as followers of Jesus, should live our lives a little bit counter-culturally? Frankly, uh, normal is, is killing Americans. Just in the West, I know there's people watching from all over. Just let me speak to the Western church for a moment. Heart disease, <clears throat> hypertension, are all at, they're all at an all-time high. And matter of fact, what crushes me is before we finish gathering today, 30 people in the United States will have decided to take their own life. We're stressed. We're overwhelmed. We're anxious. It's because this is what culture gives us. See, culture says this is normal. Now, I would just like to propose that maybe the church should look a little bit different. Culture is fatigue. Sabbath is energy. You're saying, Ronnie, if I just give one day of rest, you're telling me that I'm not going to be fatigued. Yeah, there might be some other things, sugar, water, sleep, maybe like 30 minutes of exercise a, a week. I mean, there's some other things. But it, it gives fatigue, and the Sabbath claims to give us energy. Culture is exhausted. Everybody is exhausted. They're all uh, tired. And Sabbath says you'll be replenished. Culture is always in a hurry. And Sabbath is calm. Culture is anxiety. And Sabbath is security. It's the ultimate form of trust in the Father. Culture, it's expected to be all of those things. And the Sabbath is countercultural. I don't know what you need to hear today. I don't know if for you it's you're you're leaning more towards the slothfulness sign. That you're you're leaning towards that uh you know the average person spends three and a half hours a day on either Netflix or social media? I checked, just for me. And it was like forty seven minutes, and I'm like, what are you doing with your life? I don't know if you know, you can go and ask how long you're spending on social media. Most of the apps have it. You're like, man, that's going to be depressing. Probably. <laughs> I don't have time to read the Word of God, but I just binge watched the entire first season of The Last Kingdom. I haven't yet. It's in my queue, season five. It, it's interesting to me that that overwhelmed is the disease of our new millennium, and what if Sabbath is the actual cure? Four of five Americans, that means all your friends, <laughs> they say they need to reduce stress in their lives. This week, will you take a real and genuine account of your emotional life, your physical life, your personal life, and your financial life? Will you see where you're allowing for Sabbath in margin? If you are in this room, and I know this isn't the case, we have pastors that watch in Africa and all over, but if, if you're in this room, you're in the top 3% of the world. Like, what about the top 1%? You're close. You're in the top 3%. The top 3%, that's who we represent. Most of us are stressed, anxious. We run out of money before we run out of money. You're overwhelmed. We live in, now I know inflation is crazy, but we live in unrivaled prosperity, and yet we are so discontent. There's an African proverb that says this about us. It says, Americans have all the watches, but we have all the time. Yeah, just let that sink in in a pinch. Let me give you three reasons we don't Sabbath. Can I give you three? I want to get real practical here. Reason number one we do not Sabbath is because of a poor work environment. Now, this could mean a poor work ethic. It could mean that. It could mean you're supposed to be being productive and you're watching YouTube on your hobby. Right? I don't know if anybody else, anybody else guilty. Okay. There's some honest people in the house this morning. It could mean that you, like me, have the spiritual gift of procrastination, and you just keep putting things off until the list of things put off is so overwhelming, you put them off. You're creating a poor work environment for yourself. And because of that, we feel like we don't have time for Sabbath. Now, listen, I also know that some of you in this house, 
might have a cruel taskmaster. I mean, maybe they are. Maybe their expectations upon you do not honor the idea of having any time off. And my challenge to you would be prayerfully consider where the Father might be sending you elsewhere. If your boss, if he or she doesn't respect or honor the Sabbath, just have a real heartfelt conversation with them about it. The second reason we don't Sabbath is a poor heart condition. What we do is we make the Sabbath a burden instead of a blessing. We make it a religious expectation, and so we do so with no joy instead of showing up on this day, receiving the gift of Sabbath and saying, thank you, Jesus. Ironically enough that this stewardship principle of time is also directly tied to your finances. Now, if you're new around here, you're like, I was waiting for that preacher to talk about money. I ain't talking to you. I'm talking to the church. (laughs) It's interesting that we say, well, I don't have enough, therefore I can't. And basically what we're telling God is that he's a liar. God, you can't do more with less. A poor heart condition. Number three, and this is the most important, is we don't plan a Sabbath. You have to choose to Sabbath or you will choose not to. So let me give you some advice. Let me just talk to you for a moment. Week to week, that might change. Some of you are maybe in a a job right now that doesn't allow you to have one day to Sabbath. What I would challenge you to do is make sure that you're planning at least a week or two out so that you can Sabbath. Ashley does Sabbath a little bit weird. She knows that whenever my day off, and my day off changes every week to week, okay? It, it just does. I get the, the same, I take the same day off um, every other week, and, that, and that's how I do it. And so it's two different days a week. And what we know as a family is she has to prepare the day before so we can truly honor the Sabbath. It takes preparation. So the third reason is because we don't plan a Sabbath, and I'm sure you've heard it before, but if you fail to plan, then you plan to food, laundry, errands. Let me give you three reasons we do Sabbath. We believe that the Sabbath is a gift. That rest is a gift. And so we intentionally allow our soul to be replenished, our lives to be fulfilled, and our faith to be lived. We've said it so many times over the years that faith isn't something you have or that you hold on to. Faith is something you live out. It's faithfulness. It's the way that we live our lives. That We live our lives in a counterculture way that honors the Word of God. And so when people look at us, they're like, why is that cat so rested? Why, why, why are they at such peace? Why do their lives to be filled, to seem to be void of, of anxiety? Because we choose the Sabbath. The, the, and, and I'm closing. We, 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 the reasons we Sabbath is we remember Jesus' work by stopping ours. We just cease to work. We think it's important to gather with your family and friends and, and just celebrate a day of rest. The second reason that we Sabbath is we want to honor the rhythms of God. If he, he put these rhythms in our life, then he's wanting us to live them out. And so we plan our Sabbath, but we allow flexibility, but we don't make excuses about being lazy. We, this is where it's hard. I'll just be honest with you. We just say, okay, God, I'm going to come to this point where I'm just going to believe that your way is better. I know we're just saying that. That wasn't planned. We don't plan these things. They do their thing. And then, but your way is better. God, I'm just going to believe your way is better. And so I'm going to do everything I can to honor the rhythms that you've put in my life. And this is what I would say is if you can't change your pace, then you need to change your place. If you can't change the rhythms, then maybe God's telling you that's not where you're supposed to be. I know that's hard. I know what it's like to get rid of the car you have a car payment on and buy a beater so you can create more margin and then just pray the tires stay on as you drive it to and from work. 
I know what it's like to give up things that are important for something that's significant. The third reason we Sabbath is because we just want to enjoy Jesus. We want to say, Father, there's this one day that you say you're going to connect with me, and so I'm going to turn my phone off. And if that scares you, turn, put it on to do not disturb mode so your spouse and your children can still get a hold of you. Do something. But stop doing this, or however you hold your phone. I mean, my finger should be a lot bigger. Like, you know, have you seen Lady in the Water where the dude's got the one swell arm? Like, these two should just be. Just turn it off. I, I want us, the three greatest desires, now the, the three greatest needs of all people, I'm sure you've heard it on the spectrum and all that is, you know, water, food, and shelter. But the three greatest needs of your spirit are transcendent significance in community. Transcendence is the idea is there's something higher, and maybe you're still figuring that out, whether it's Jesus or not. We invite you to figure it out with us. But transcendence, there's this desire to be connected to this higher power. We just know it's Messiah. In significance, all of us desire to give our lives to something bigger than ourselves. And in community, we desire community. And the Sabbath plays a part in us connecting with God. Please don't let life steal a gift from you. Stealing a gift from your family. It's not an excuse to be lazy whenever you Sabbath. If we're averaging two hours on Netflix and three hours on social media or vice versa, then it's not a time issue. Be honest with yourself. It's a stewardship issue. You have time to, to slow down. I believe the most damaging impact or lack of Sabbath in our lives is it takes away freedom. You were created to have freedom in Christ. You were created to live a passion-filled life. Many of us have trapped in our lives, and we don't feel like there can be any hope. I just want you to take an honest inventory of where you are, what you're trading your life for, what you're giving your life for. Can I just tell you that a satisfied life is better than a successful life? I just promise you that if you just be satisfied in the plan and the will of God for your life, it'll be so much greater than what you define as success, which is usually being defined by someone other than you.